Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here and for having me. And it's a privilege. I know some of you from the years gone by and many new friends, and I feel blessed to uh, have this opportunity. What I'm going to try to do is weave together decades of my life and my career and my work and uh, share with you some of what's current for me. So um, we've gone through a couple of different titles on this uh, presentation. I'm going to call this one Living Deeply. And in it, I will weave together some of the most current work we're doing on Death Makes Life Possible. So just to position this conversation in the current times, and you know, it is really a remarkable moment in history when we have this convergence of different worldviews, belief systems, ways of engaging reality. Uh, on the one hand, we have the enormous successes of Western science and technology, you know, an orbiting space station. We have a, a cloned cat named Carbon Copy. Uh, in the course of an afternoon, we can create new life forms that historically had taken millions, if not billions, of years to evolve. So it's a, a great testament to our ability to manage the objective world. Uh, and at the same time now, we have access to the world's wisdom and spiritual traditions. Uh, a couple of keystrokes on our computer will gain access to sacred texts that were once available to a small group of adepts somewhere in the Himalayas, uh, and now they can come to your living room. And I think that in the process of this convergence between these different ways of knowing, uh, we have different responses. Uh, on one hand, there is this idea of conflict, intolerance. There is a way in, what, in which one truth system trumps the other. And we see this uh, every day when we pick up the newspaper. We can see the kind of violence that comes when people simply can't deal with another person's point of view. Uh, a second response to the convergence is what I'll call co-option. And you can see this particularly in the context of indigenous peoples where they want this technology. They want access to you know, airplanes and internet and things that were you know, very um, much not part of their world. Uh, I've had the privilege of working in the Ecuadorian Amazon with the Achuar and seeing the changes that have happened in their community just in the last 20 years as they've had more and more contact with the West. Uh, and then the third response is what I'll call creativity. The idea that when these different truth systems meet, it gives us this opportunity to birth something new. And I think that's what we're doing here. I think we are those people in that place of meeting, and we are beginning to generate new ways of being in the world, new ways of understanding who we are and what it means to be human at this unique time. It's also a time of acceleration. You know, people are rushing, 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 and we have these major weapons of mass distraction. Everywhere we look, you know, we're <laughs> divided. And so, you know, many of us can probably empathize with this slide of just trying to get through the obstacles and trying to make it to the end of the day without being completely exhausted. Uh, and so what do we do about that? Um, this slide, for those of you who can't read it, remember when everything used to be nice and solid? <laughs> you know, living in this quantum world where there's nothing absolute, it becomes a little disorienting for people. And so how do we begin to create communities of support so that we can navigate together? And I think that's ultimately the solution. So what are the main questions that I want to raise? How do we manage this complexity? What are the skills and capacities that we need in order to be fully engaged in the 21st century? And how is it that we can move from coping to flourishing? So what are the ways in which there are inner capacities, the kind of capacities we're exploring here, that can help us to manage the outer complexities? So it's a way in which to match the resilience and the hardiness that we can develop inside with then all of the things that we often can do nothing about that rest outside of ourselves. Really, I'm fine. It was just a fleeting sense of purpose. I'm sure it will pass. <laughs> and how many of us have felt that? You know, we live in a culture that doesn't honor meaning, doesn't honor subjectivity, doesn't want to know how you really feel. <laughs> and so I think it's, you know, this is changing and it's changing because of the work here and other organizations where there is a recognition that we need to honor the nature of meaning and purpose in our lives. 
So just a little backstory about me. How did I come into all of this? Um, I think that I came into this work before I can even remember. Uh, I was a precocious, inquisitive toddler, 18 months old, dressed in my pink jammies, exploring the world, uh, being the empiricist that an 18-month-old is, um, which means, you know, you put everything in your mouth. <laughs> this is what is so. Uh, and unfortunately, my father had inadvertently left a can of lighter fluid sitting on the table. And so lighter fluid in the mouth led to three months in and out of intensive care in the hospital. And while I don't remember any of that, I think it really helped to um, plant the seeds in me of a deep appreciation for health and healing practitioners, the doctors, the nurses, the people who were there to support me during that time. Uh, and I also think it was something about that semi-permeable membrane between living and dying. You know, I came close to dying, would come back into, you know, health and then um, transition again. So it had turned into a deep pneumonia in my lungs. So I think that was the first bit of a calling. And then when I was growing up in Detroit in the 60s and 70s and feeling rebellious and unhappy about everything that was happening in the world, and um, one day I was on the back of uh, a motorcycle somewhere I shouldn't have been with somebody I shouldn't have been with. Uh, it was closing time at the bar, and a drunk driver came out and hit us. And um, I distinctly remember something that's not going to feel odd to you, but um, watching my body tumbling through the air from the perspective of another place. And so I think that was maybe the first real wake up to me about the nature of consciousness and the ways in which our consciousness is not simply embodied, that there are these dimensions to who we are that extend beyond the physical. And so that was a very great opening for me in terms of an experiential um, uh, welcome to this field and uh, ultimately led me, not immediately, but you know, probably within the next four or five years, to becoming an active participant in this kind of work. So that then leads me to the next phase in my journey, which, um, you know, having come through different uh, organizations, the Rhine Center was a, an immensely important place for me in my early career. Uh, went and worked at the Mind Science Foundation in San Antonio, Texas. I know we've got a conference coming up there. Um, great work, wonderful opportunities. And then I had the, the chance, actually when I was in college, to read a book called Psychic Exploration by Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut. And that book literally changed my life. It sent me on an odyssey, sent me to explore, wanted to be part of the revolution, wanted to be there for the paradigm shift, and felt that consciousness was the gateway, and, um, and that there were ways in which we could marry the rigor of science with these ineffable qualities of our human experience. And so that led me you know, to Bob Morris and to uh, the Rhine Center and other places. But this story really starts with, with Edgar Mitchell and his uh, experience of traveling to the moon. And when he was complete, his historic walk on the moon was done. Um, and here was a guy who really did believe in the Newtonian paradigm. You know, he had been on call during Apollo 13. Any of you who ever saw the movie Apollo 13, if you haven't, you should see it. Um, it was a near miss. And so there were lots of question marks about the safety of this kind of mission. And would Edgar make it home safely? And so he walked on the moon, got into the capsule, and he describes having the window seat on the way home. And on the way home, they did what they called the barbecue rotation. So as they're entering the Earth's orbit, they were rotating. And he was able to watch the Earth, the moon, and the sun rising and setting, and rising and setting. And here he was you know, hurtling through space, the vastness and majesty of it all. And he had sort of two insights or two epiphanies. Uh, the first epiphany was looking down at this beautiful, pristine planet Earth and recognizing there were no boundaries. There were no race boundaries, ethnic boundaries, national boundaries, state boundaries. There were no boundaries. There was this beautiful whole planet. And yet, as an inhabitant of spaceship Earth, we know about the conflicts. We know about the tensions. And so it was kind of a suffering 
this first phase of his epiphany, that you know, there was this pain that we are all experiencing, and yet it isn't coming from out there. It's coming from in here. It's coming from our consciousness, from our worldview, from our belief systems. And so perhaps the great you know, frontier wasn't outer space, but really inner space, and trying to understand what leads to this suffering, and what can we do to alleviate it. The second part of his epiphany came when he recognized the unitive nature of life, and that the molecules in his body connected him to the molecules in the Big Bang, and that he was connected to the colleagues in that space capsule, and connected to everybody in every living form on planet Earth. And so when he came back, he described it as a kind of samadhi experience, this kind of transformation that allowed him a sense of unit of consciousness. And so that ultimately led him to um, create the Institute of Noetic Sciences, where the goal was to build a bridge between these inner epiphanies, awarenesses, and the, the kind of discernment and rigor that he saw in the Apollo program. So we began to look at this idea of worldview transformation, and how is it that in understanding the nature of our experiences, I'll read every slide, no need to worry. Um, if you can't see it, I'll help. Um, so one day I was in my office and Willis Harmon, who was then the president of IONS, brought a gentleman to my office and his name was Richard Gunther uh, and he was a very, very successful businessman. And Richard felt that he had had one of these worldview transformations and he had been on a deck in Big Sur, looked out at the ocean, and felt unity. And it was such a powerful, transformative experience for him, he came back and he wondered first, is there something wrong with him? <laughs> you know, was this weird? Um, and if not, were there other people who'd had these experiences? And was there something that we could learn from these experiences that would help other people to have these kind of epiphanies? And so that started us on a, a journey of exploration. Uh, we dug into the scientific and medical literatures and, and found that by and large, these kinds of experiences were considered pathological. They were delusional, they were psychotic. Um, they weren't something that was about, you know, rush out and have this moment. <laughs> Sign up for a gateway program. Uh, it wasn't that, you know, and so, um, what we then did is to start collecting stories, and we invited people to tell us about their transformative experiences. And we got many, hundreds of people wrote in and told us about what had triggered the transformation, what sustained it, what were the consequences of it. Uh, and we began to kind of create a natural history. And then from that, we did focus groups with adepts from different world traditions who taught transformation. From that, we went into a detailed interview-based program where we interviewed 60 masters, uh, 20 questions, systematically analyzed it, spent two years with a group going through all the material. Uh, and from that, really came up with a, a change model. So worldview transformation. Provo these are profound shifts in consciousness and they're long-lasting. They are something that isn't just a moment. They're something that stays with us and defines us. Um, they shape our experiences, how we relate to ourselves, how we relate to others. Uh, and oftentimes, they can occur in a collective so that together we can begin to foster this kind of worldview transformation. There are different kinds of transformation. There are negative transformations. You can look at the Al-Qaeda training camps, or you can look at Nazi Germany. You can see that these were transformative movements, but not transformative in a life-enhancing way. Uh, and so that obviously wasn't the, the place we wanted to start. We wanted to really look at these positive transformations that promote meaning, give us a sense of purpose, and help us to feel that, that sense of connection and oneness. So the model we were looking at and the, the basis of the research, which then led to some longitudinal studies with um, special populations. Uh, we also did surveys with thousands of people trying to calibrate what we'd learned from the masters with the kind of average householder. Uh, and our goal was to find the predictors. What predicts these kind of transformative experiences? And what are the outcomes? Where does it go? Um, what are the moderators? So, on whom, under what circumstances? Because we know that not all transformative practices apply to all people. 
You know, some people like to do quiet sitting meditations. Some people go crazy doing quiet sitting meditations. Uh, in fact, there's a really um, Willoughby, Willoughby, what's her last name? Um, Willoughby Bartholomew, I think. Uh, anyway, she's been doing a lot of work. She's a psychiatrist who's really kind of uh, taken a, um, an alternative perspective on the science of meditation, saying, you know, a lot of people have psychotic results as a, you know, sitting still and listening. So it's not all wonder and goodness. <laughs> And then the mediators, why and how do these transformations happen? So really, the so what? Where does it get to us? This is just a diagram. I know you can't read it, but this is an example of the kinds of um, worldviews we sampled when we were doing the work. And so, you know, the Western kind of organized religious groups, we've got the Eastern, indigenous, and in the middle, the kind of emergent forms, like Monroe, like um, you know, Stan Groff's holotropic breath work or Angelis Arian's fourfold path. There are these kind of emergent forms that came, a lot of them, out of Northern California. And fortunately, we have an East Coast representation of these alternatives. And this led us to publish a book and create a, a DVD that had practices on um, worldview transformation. So this is just a little experiment in your own transformative process. So if you want to play, uh, if you take your finger and point it up at the sky, and you start to rotate it in a clockwise direction, okay, clockwise. And make sure you're going clockwise. And then keep watching it, going clockwise. And very carefully, you might have to shift your wrist, bring it down to your chest. And then look at it. And what direction is it going? going counterclockwise. You see it? If you don't, try it again. <laughs> this is experiential learning. <laughs> and the point is that it's nothing changed about the direction of your finger. What changed is your perspective. And so this is the key. You know, it's not about expecting something radical to change out there. It's what happens inside us that changes and allows us to see things differently. So this transformation model is what I'm going to dig into, and that will lead me into my current work on Death Makes Life Possible. So we, in the course of all of this data collection, were looking at what does facilitate these transformations. And what we found, by and large, is that it came out of what we called noetic experiences. And noetic comes from the Greek uh, nous. William James has my favorite definition of noetic. Um, states of insight unplumbed by the discursive intellect, all inarticulate though they remain, and yet they carry with them a curious sense of authority. So we have these insights. We don't really have a language to describe them, but they move us. They propel us to do things that we may never have even thought to do. And sometimes they're suspect, particularly in a culture that doesn't honor uh, the interior and the subjective. So um, I have spent the last two years making a film. It's called Death Makes Life Possible in partnership with Deepak Chopra and others. Uh, and we went around and we interviewed people about um, you know, their experiences of consciousness, uh, death, what they think happens beyond. And so I've kind of, uh, rather than show you the whole film, uh, I've inserted a couple little pieces so you get a taste of it, and I'm using these pieces to help illustrate the change model. So if we could just go ahead and trigger this one. The event that changed my life was I was on my way to dinner one evening with my wife. We'd been married for five months. On our way to our favorite restaurant, a van crossed a stop sign at between 70 and 80 miles an hour. It broadsided our car and bulldozed us clear across Beverly Boulevard. The car took off and flew through the air and hit that tree in midair and came to rest in those bushes over there. That night, the doctors saved my life. I was at the deepest level of coma that they measure, the Glasgow Coma Skill 3. When I came out of the coma, pieces of memory started to come back. The memory from my coma came to me of a protector who was traveling with me through this inner space, through this journey into infinity. 
I was traveling through an ancient uh, grove on a boat, and I could hear the sounds of rain pattering down in the cabin. Uh, and there was a person who was up on the deck uh, who I knew I would be safe if I could only just go up to be with her. And very slowly, in the middle of the night, it occurred to me who that protector was. And I realized it was my wife. And the following morning, um, my mother came to the hospital to explain that I hadn't always been in this room and in this bed. The reason I was in this room and in this bed was because I'd been in an accident. That before this room and this bed, I'd been a filmmaker, and that yes, I was married to Marcy, and that she had died instantly in the crash. And uh, during my month in coma, she had been laid to rest in Phoenix, Arizona. So I'd lost everything, really, that mattered most to me. Um, and that started this journey through consciousness to find what makes us who we are, could I recover who I was, and also to find a reason to go forward. Okay. So one of the things that we saw in the context of, um, you know, these noetic experiences is that they're often painful. You know, we can have these peak experiences and uh, opportunities that all of you are, you know, trained to teach people. But when we looked at the data, um, the vast majority of time, it wasn't something that people dove into voluntarily. And so it was either, you know, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job, some destabilization that rocked them from their steady state. And I think then, oftentimes, the work that you're, you're doing as trainers and facilitators is to really help people to integrate. Because one of the side effects that we see in this model is that if people don't have a context, don't have a community, don't have a way of integrating it, they can deny it. And we have these remarkable defense mechanisms that say, that didn't make any sense. I am not paying attention to it. And I find that incredibly interesting, these defense mechanisms and the, the various barriers. So what are these barriers that prevent us from making a life-changing uh, decision. So if information confirms our values, we're more open-minded. If it refutes our worldview, our values, our belief systems, it is very easy for us to reject it. And there's some fascinating data uh, that was done by a group at the Yale University's Cultural Cognition Project. And I encourage you to check it out. They've done lots of little experiments with people. Uh, they'll take folks who have um, beliefs on one side or another of controversial issues. Abortion. Pro, con. And they bring them in and they give them identical information. And then they look to see if people have changed at all in their position. And what you find is that people become more entrenched as a result of the same material. So people will interpret data to support whatever their own hypothesis is. And we know this from parapsychology. You know. So there are these studies that have been done where they're attempting to learn about and to understand how it is that people um, are unable to question their assumptions. So this is a wonderful series of studies that was done by a, a guy named Kevin Dunbar. And Kevin was interested in looking at different um, populations. And in particular, he went in and studied scientists. You know, scientists who are in the vanguard of making breakthroughs, right? Who are interested in exploring new things, helping us to map the great unknown. Yeah. So, and what he found is that when he exposed these people to data that confirmed their hypothesis, the learning center of the brain lit up. And they were ready to take it in. And they'll tell you all about it. And they can give you the details. However, if the information refutes their hypothesis, the warning center of the brain lights up. And they're actually, not only are they resisting the information, they actually don't even acknowledge it. It doesn't even go into their awareness, into their consciousness. And this is a pretty scary idea. Because if the only new things we're learning are the things we expect to learn, it probably wouldn't surprise Google, but it is a problem for us developing ourselves in the, in the course of a lifetime. So when people receive information that is inconsistent with their preferred theory, learning does not easily occur. And this is really important for all of us as we're trying to expand you know, people's understanding of the world 
I think it also gives us an opportunity to be more uh, sympathetic to people who have opposing viewpoints. So another short video to illustrate this point. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless and I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing. You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, you're out. not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just, sometimes it's like, there's this achy, I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't. Could you recognize that in anyone you know? <laughs> no. Never me. <laughs> So the goal can't be to create a kind of psychological house of mirrors. It's not like we're trying to get people to see what we want them to see. The goal is to create an environment that allows people to be open-minded. And I think by presenting these kind of barriers, by making it funny, you know, helping people to sort of diminish their tension and rightness, um, we can have a lot more opportunity to move things forward. Okay, so back to the change model then. So we have these noetic experiences, we have the capacities to um, understand them, explore them, deny them, insulate ourselves from them, or we can start a process of seeking. We can want to discover, we can want to understand more. And I think that's a lot of the people that you work with, are the people who've had something or feel some discomfort and want to learn something new. And so you're there to help them in that process of discovery and exploration. The shadow side of this is that people can get caught up in endless seeking and they become just, you know, the, the dalliers who go from one particular practice to another and, and they never really go deep. They just kind of skate at the surface and aren't really about, um, I was one time at Esalen in the hot tub with, um, um, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I was with, um, this guy who was just a you know brilliant person, and there and I was with Elizabeth Rauscher, and people were talking about all these high-level, multi-dimensional geometry, blah blah blah, and and there was a woman in the tub, and she said, "Oh well, you know, I have been through EST and TM and the chakras and the blah blah blah." And she listed like ten things she'd done, which said to us, "You know, I'm transformed. You're not. You're like still stuck in this wacky stuff." And Will Schutz was the man's name. He said, beware the chakra skippers. <laughs> and it was like one of those great insights I've never forgotten. Because you can't just skip steps in this process. You really need to ground these experiences and allow yourself to really integrate them. We're all born scientists. We all want to understand the world. We're empiricists. We're checking things out. We are putting things in our mouth. And sometimes we confirm our hypotheses, and sometimes we don't. See him? He's, he's sampling the world. Sweet. Okay, so in this process of discovery, I inserted another little piece from the film Death Makes Life Possible. Uh, many of you probably know Peter, uh, wonderful scientist, great guy. So what we're going to find here is Peter and Daniel Brinkley interspersed in terms of worldviews. So if we can just go ahead and play that.
Distinguished neurophysiologist and senior lecturer at King's College London, his studies of death, near death, and out-of-body experiences provide interesting insight into what happens at the point of dying. I, I was led to this work really by chance. I believed that there was nothing in near-death experiences. They were experiences which happened in California. They never crossed the sea to England. And so I, I thought that they probably were more imagination. Then a case came into my consulting room. He'd had a cardiac arrest. He'd had a near-death experience. And I knew that they were real. I was sitting holding the telephone. Lightning came down the phone line. It hit me on the side of the head. It went down my spine. It welded the nails of the heels of my shoes to the nails in the floor, it threw me in the air, suspended me in the air, slammed me back down on the bed. It melted the phone. And I was burning and hurting so bad. Then all of a sudden I left out. And everything was cool. <laughs> I looked down on the bed, I saw me on the bed. I saw Sandy come running down the hall. My friend who was on the other end of the phone heard the explosion, he came, he called the paramedics. The greatest thing that I discovered at that point was that first, the place that I was was between this world and the next, but I knew it better than any place I had ever been living in this physical life. It looks as if when brain function is down, there is a set of experiences in which you leave your body and watch the resuscitation process. Now, what happens during this out-of-body process? Remember, no brain function. You've got a cardiac arrest. You're not breathing. All the brainstem reflexes have gone. So it is, in fact, a very good model for death itself. I watched them load me in the ambulance. I, I watched the things that went on. I really didn't care because where I was floating above it was so much better than where I was when I was involved in it. And I was in the ambulance and the guy said, he's gone, he's gone. And me, I thought, gone where? <laughs> I'm here, the paramedics here, where's anybody going? And I heard these chimes and I moved down this tunnel. I come into this place of light and I sensed uh, an absolute sense of safety. If it's true that uh you really do have experiences when the brain is not working, then it means the consciousness or mind, if you like, are in fact not the same as brain. It's a fundamental step. So we have this idea that there's a catalyst, um, that people can then engage these experiences, attempt to learn more. Uh, they can have the shadow side of that, which is sort of continuous seeking, or they can begin to ground it in some kind of practice. And what we found is that um, really 100% of the people we interviewed had some kind of practice or had explored some different practices. And so finding a practice becomes extremely important. Uh, and there are elements of practices. So when I say we did the study, you know, we were interviewing people who were Catholics, Buddhists, Hindus, atheists, um, Wiccans. And so you can imagine, like, what does a Catholic priest and a Wiccan priestess have in common? You know, there was a time when they didn't have a lot in common. Uh, and yet what we were able to do is pull from the various uh, experiences and procedures uh, to come up with a set of qualities. And these probably won't surprise you, uh, but they kind of represent the, um, the territory of a transformative practice. And the first is setting intention. So I intend to integrate these experiences to change my life, to make life meaningful for me and for people around me. But we know that the road to hell is paved with good intention. And we don't always get there. So uh, intention alone is not enough. These transformative practices also involve our opportunity to shift our attention. And so is the glass half empty? Is the glass half full? Is there a nail in my head? Do I choose to see it? Um, it we have this capacity to shift our attention. And we know now from the neurosciences and some of the social psychology literature that there's something called inattentional blindness. So we know that our culture primes us to see certain things. 
So the material world, the objective world, that's what is real. That is what is so. If you can touch it and measure it and manipulate it, it's so. Uh, but we know in this room that there's more to it than that. In this body of literature in inattentional blindness, they have shown over and over and over again that if you have a strong bias and an orientation or a priming to perceive certain things about the world, other things can present themselves, you simply don't see them. So the great experiment uh, about a basketball game, you've got two teams, one's wearing white shirts, one's wearing black shirts. Um, everybody's focused on counting the number of times that the teams take possession of the ball. Focus on the ball. And in the middle of it comes a gorilla, bangs his chest, and, and all of a sudden then moves back out. And you ask people, well, what'd you see? And today many people are aware of this experiment, so more people see it. When we first started using that, it was a very small percent of any audience who would actually see the gorilla because they weren't yeah. expecting to see the gorilla. And they were focused with their awareness on something else. It becomes a brilliant metaphor for what we do in our lives. And so I think part of the work here is to help people to understand that there are more things we can pay attention to. So attention becomes a powerful aspect of transformative practice. Repetition, so building new habits. Uh, we know that the brain lays down these neural pathways, that these neural pathways are like grooves in the snow. Um, you get into a rut, your tires go with the rut. You have a really hard time breaking out of that. But we also know through neuroplasticity that it's possible to rewire these habits. And so transformative practices over a period of time can help us to develop new ways of seeing, new ways of being. Uh, and so it develops new habits. It's really interesting, I read a lot about this stuff, and you know, just the whole way in which we're primed to see the negative. You can give people a life of experiences. In the course of a day, you've had like all these really wonderful meetings with so-and-so, and then somebody says, you know, you gave that talk and everything, but you really said, ah, too many times. So I go home, and tonight I'm laying in my bed, and I'm thinking, you know, all these people said all these really nice things to me, but he said, I say, ah, too many times. So what do I go to bed thinking about? You know, that the brain holds those negatives. And so, again, it's repeating new practices, new habits that allow us to look at what is positive. Where are we placing our attention? How can we bring our intention to shifting that so that we can begin to acknowledge all the beauty around us instead of fixating on what isn't working for us? <laughs> Guidance. 99% um, of the people we interviewed talked about the need for a teacher somebody to help navigate, somebody who's been on the path, a facilitator, a trainer who can guide you through this set of steps. Um, and yet we know that it's not all about a teacher. There is this noetic quality. And so how do we help people to develop and expand their own inner guidance? And I think that's part of what uh, the work is here. And then finally, I think that these are four dimensions that are ultimately wrapped in the arms of surrender or acceptance. The world out there isn't necessarily going to change. It's really about how we respond to it. What are those inner capacities we need to be more resilient in the face of the change? Okay, so this is again from the film. Uh, this is Lee Lipsenthal, a physician who uh, ended up with a terminal cancer diagnosis. We follow him through the film. This is um, a little practice. I thought it'd be sweet just for you to take a moment. So if we can go ahead. And... I want to thank everyone for coming, for bringing your unique and special love for Lee here today. Lee was absolutely adamant that this was supposed to be a celebration of life, his and everyone else's year. And so with that in mind, we figured we'd turn the beginning over to Lee. I want you gently to close your eyes and begin taking deep breaths in and out. Now start thinking of people you love, those that bring meaning to your life. Begin to feel the sense of appreciation in your body. Do you feel it in your chest, your stomach, your back? 
continue to breathe deeply in and out. Now think of a place that you love to be, a place that brings you peace, and image yourself in that place. And now you're joined in that place by someone you really love. Allow them to sit with you. Look at their face. And in your mind, tell them how you feel about them. So these practices allow us to expand our dimensionality and to deepen our experiences and to honor all those facets of who we are and who we want to be. The problem with practices is that they can become something that is an end in itself. And as I mentioned, the woman who was skipping the chakras in the hot tub at Esalen, you know, the practice can become the end in itself and it can become a virtuous claim. And so rather than seeing it as um, an aspect of our unfolding, we can be very locked in and we can become rigid about our practice. We can become virtuous that our practice is better than someone else's practice and therefore there's this kind of righteousness that happens. So then the next step is really beginning to think about life as practice. So it isn't about sitting on a pillow. It isn't about being in one of these cushy little rooms with the sound coming out, which I love, by the way. <laughs> this morning was such a great way to wake up. Um, it isn't about that, though. It's about taking these qualities that we learn, embodying them, and then moving out into the world and recognizing that there is suffering, that there is hardship, that people who do hospice work, for example, know what a gift it is to be with someone at that final point in their life doesn't mean we're happy about it. It means that we have been in the presence of grace. And so being able to take these qualities, bring them into our lives, and to make life the practice. So is it the ticket taker at the toll booth who we give a little loving kindness to? Is it that person in the grocery store? Is it that difficult work person uh, who just pushes our buttons every which way? You know, how can we make our carpool a sangha? How can we make the complexities of whatever the daily experiences are something that offers us the opportunity to grow and to learn and to bring these kinds of experiences in? Sharon Salzberg, Buddhist teacher, was one of the people we interviewed. If we remember that our spiritual life is not just for ourselves alone, but about how we live every day, how we relate to our children, how we relate to our parents, how we earn a living, how we speak to one another. It's the little things we do in the course of a day. And if we mess up, if we say the wrong thing, it's the opportunity to express forgiveness for ourselves, for others, and to keep moving. Because we're not perfect, and we have to just understand and acknowledge that. So life as practice becomes this opportunity. One of the things that happens as a pitfall in this process is that it becomes all about me. And I'm this great person who's out there sharing the word. Um, and I forget that it's really a we. So how do we begin to move from the I to the we? And we know that um, there are pitfalls here. People can become very generous. They become very service oriented. And those are beautiful qualities. But they may forget to take care of themselves. They may forget to ground themselves and keep themselves happy. So how do you have a healthy me in order to be a healthy participant in the we? And I think that's a big part of what happens in um, this kind of transformative process. So, you know, forgetting the me and the we, how do we really find that way that it is this kind of collective, healthy individuation in the midst of our uh, connectivity? These are just, the Institute of Noetic Sciences has a very beautiful campus, and we had a National Geographic photographer who came in and took all these great pictures, so I just use them whenever I can. So ultimately, it's living deeply. And I think that you know, in my last couple of years of work, it's been how do we live deeply with our awareness about our own mortality? How do we find a way to shift that fear into an inspiration for living and dying well? And so one of the things that I'm doing with this film, with the book, with some educational programs, with all of you, is participating in a movement to redefine death. 
And in that process, to move from the pathology of this kind of denial into something that is a celebration of life. And so this is just one of the posters. We've been all over doing film festivals. Uh, we're in the... Um, we're in a film festival in Germany right now this weekend. Uh, we'll be in the Sonoma Film Festival next weekend. Uh, we just got picked up by Oprah Network for um, <laughs> so next year. She's going to do the, um, the North American broadcast premiere of the film. So that's just like every independent filmmaker's dream come true. It took me a week of waking up in the morning and pinching myself. But. So. Ernest Becker has been very influential in my thinking about this, certainly informed a lot of the kind of theoretical framework for the book. He writes, the irony of man's condition is that the deepest need is to be free of the anxiety of death and annihilation. But it is life itself which awakens it. And so we must shrink from being, we must shrink from being fully alive. So he wrote this great book, he won a Pulitzer for it, The Denial of Death which then led to this body of research called terror management theory. And fascinating work there about how if people are in denial of death, and if culture supports that denial, and then we get triggered, it can lead to these aberrant behaviors. So it can lead to, for example, this kind of insulated in-group identification. So I'm going to only affiliate with people who have the same values that I have, and I am going to be aggressive and hostile toward those people who are the other. And all we have to do is read the newspaper and find out that this is rampant in the world. I love this cartoon. Is this someone's idea of a joke? This is God. You are here. <laughs> So this idea of this change model, obviously it's not linear, obviously it doesn't always go one step to the next, um, but that there are these qualities that are fractal-like. And we can find that there are ways in which, um, you know, we may skip around in this, but basically these steps are uh, pretty reliable. And it then leads to something that iterates out from ourselves. So we can have our own individual change process, but then how do we bring these into our collective? How do we really help to facilitate a total tra transformation in the dominant institutions of our culture? And so the idea that there are ways in which we can take these um, principles and we can apply them in medicine or in business or in healthcare or in community. Um, how do we begin to work with uh, hospitals, for example. Uh, a big part of what my interest in is helping to shift healthcare's perspective on death and to help us to recognize that this kind of heroics that we're facing often translates into a diminishment of quality of life for people. How can we help to nurture those people on the front lines, the nurses and the doctors? How can we help to support the patients as they make these transitions? That's a big part of what is my motivation. We also created, team and I, a program for high school students called Worldview Explorations. And this is a, a curriculum for high school students to take these principles and apply them in their own lives. Because if you can start younger, maybe we will get past some of the kind of bullying and aberrant behaviors that we find in community. Okay, so here's one more um, little short clip from the movie. Uh, we've just done a cut. This clip got cut, unfortunately, but um, you'll get to see it. So let's go ahead and play that. Be aware that we are part of a continuum. We were here at the time of the Big Bang. I never died. From the time of Big Bang, I was here. And I will never die. I'll be here for the eternity. I only change form. The moment you realize that, then you are not afraid. Satish Kumar, if you don't know him, he's a remarkable person. So yeah, consciousness and healing, how do we bring our awareness into all aspects of the healing process? How do we bring these principles into education? How do we shift science so that we can expand the methodologies, that we can question the ontology? Uh, these are important things that we know need to happen if we're going to integrate the fullness of people's experience. Willis Harmon, no economic, political, or military power can compare with the power of a change of mind. 
By deliberately changing their images of reality, people are changing the world. And so it becomes not about the outside world shaping our inner experience. It's about a dialectic. And it's about our capacity to transform ourselves so that we become resilient in the face of the obstacles. And we can take these qualities and harness them as tools for our own uh, health and well-being. So this is just an example of the model applied in nature. This is my garden. This is a pumpkin. I want to show you my garden. So in addition to making a film, I spend time in the garden. And that 16-year-old son sometimes comes out and helps me. Uh, and ultimately, we're at a tipping point. You are at that frontier. It's, it's your work. It's your love. It's your commitment that really will help to bring this into being. So I thank you.